सुस्वागतम नमस्कार केम छो आदाबार्स गुड आफ्टरनून गुड मॉर्निंग गुड इवनिंग डिपेंडिंग अपॉन विच पार्ट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड यू आर आप सभी का पी आर एल के अमृत व्याख्यान में स्वागत है अभिनंदन है ए वेरी वॉम वेलकम फ्रॉम मी अनिल भारद्वाज फॉर पी आर एल का अमृत व्याख्यान टूडे इज द फोर्टी व्याख्यान ऑफ द सेवेंटी फाइव एपिसोड सीरीज ऑफ व्याख्यान विच इज बींग ऑर्गेनाइज एज अ पार्ट ऑफ पी आर एल सेवेंटी फाइव ईयर्स ऑफ लेगेसी एंड हिस्ट्री इन फंडामेंटल फिजिक्स एंड स्पेस साइंसेस इस्टेब्लिश्ड इन दर नाइनटीन फोर्टी सेवन बाई द फादर ऑफ इंडियन स्पेस प्रोग्राम डॉक्टर विक्रम साराबाई द पी आर एल प्लेटिनम जुबली कॉन्साइड्स विद India's 75 years of independence. Hence, it's a joint celebration of the development of science and technology in PRL under the banner of PRL Ka Amrit Lecture. Today, we have yet another very distinguished speaker, Dr. Perry Cox, Director of Research, CNRS, Institut de Astrophysique de Paris, from France. and he is going to deliver his vyakhyan on the cold universe a journey to our cosmic origins may i now request my colleague dr manas samal to kindly introduce today's vyakhyan karta to our audience on the webex as well as those who have joined on youtube so over to you manas uh, thank you uh, so much professor bharadwaj good afternoon everyone friends it is indeed my honor and privilege to introduce you today's speaker professor pierre cox professor cox is a renowned astronomer and researcher best known for his vast contribution to the field of some millimeter and millimeter astronomy for professor cox now the director of research from the cnrs working at the institute de astrophysique de paris france prior to this position he was the director of atacama large millimeter array popularly known as alma he served alma for 5 years to 2013 to 2018 and you all may be out of alma just the sake of just for the sake of completeness let me tell you alma is the largest ground based radio telescope in the world consisting of 66 single disc radio antennas spread over 16 km diameter giving unprecedented angular resolution at some millimeter millimeter domain before moving to alma he was the director of institute de astronomy millimetry iram again this is one of the few high resolution interferometer facility that we have in the northern hemisphere where alma was in the southern hemisphere in addition to his contribution to the development and establishment of two frontier observatories he is also known for his outstanding contribution uh, in the research area such as star forming regions evolved stars and high red shift galaxies he has more than 250, 250 rapid publications over 20000 citation to his credit in addition he has served as a member of and chair chairperson of numerous committees review panels and advisory boards such as mega project and big facility like hst nroa nroa and sma today he leads major observational efforts to study physical properties of galaxies in the universe and despite all of these what i can say he is a very warm person to you know talk about an approachable a very approachable person in fact i can say okay so friends it is indeed a great pride for all of us to listen to professor cox with this short introduction on behalf of entire prl i invite professor cox to deliver the today's vyakhyan or colloquium titled the cold universe a journey to our cosmic origin over to you professor cox well, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful introduction uh, notes and comments and i will try to uh, do my best because i feel really honored to have been invited in this uh, prestigious uh, uh, frame and uh, i will try to present you uh, some of the highlights uh, of the recent uh, years that have been obtained both with uh, alma and uh, noema 
that I have had the privilege, in fact, to direct in my uh, previous positions. So let me now share the screen. Uh, I hope that both will go fine. Up, uh, okay. And just sit. Is it uh, working? Not yet. I can see. No. You, you don't see it? No, not yet. Uh, wait, uh, I did, oh, oh, sorry, Sam. I, okay. No, it should work. I forgot to push one button. Okay. Is it yeah. okay now? We can Wonderful. see the screen. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, okay. So I'm on full screen. And so again, I'm, I'm very honored, and I will try to uh, give you an overview in the next coming hour about the cold universe and really uh, do a journey to our cosmic origins, starting from our sun to the very first uh, galaxies. So the two instruments are here shown, and I will try also to give you a background about these instruments and their properties. So first of all, let me show you a, a picture of the sky in the southern hemisphere above the ALMA site. And uh, even if you're a professional astronomer, I'm always uh, amazed by these views, and I'm always looking at it uh, uh, in complete bewilderment, and by the beauty, by the complexity, and the sheer, in, you know, incredible nature of what is surrounding us. And I think what is really pushing us into the field is to understand what is surrounding us and where we are living in. So what you see here is the uh, Milky Way, but also the uh, Magellanic clouds to the left. And uh, what I will try to explain here is what you see with these antennas you see in the, on, the, on the ground, but the eye doesn't see. And I uh, call your attention to the black area as in the Milky Way, which are really the places uh, where Alma and Marina are looking. So the uh, electromagnetic spectrum is very large. And as you know, for the visible, you see very uh, hot uh, material 10,000 degree Kelvin or so. And what I'm going to concentrate on here is the uh, millimeter, submillimeter range that is uh, really something uh, very cold uh, 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 gas and dust. And that really provides a complementary view of all the other wavelengths that are uh, possible today to be uh, used to do astronomy. Um, as you know, it is absolutely essential uh, when you try to understand a, uh, something as complex as a galaxy to have as many observations in different wavelengths as possible, because each time you look at a different wavelength, you have a completely different view as is illustrated here in the case of Centaurus A. Here you see uh, the uh, infrared emission. Here you see the CO emission done with ALMA. Um, before it was the optical. Here you see the radio emission. Here you see the X-rays. And here you see the combination of everything. So to really have a complete view of a complex uh, uh, system as a galaxy, you absolutely go, have to go through all these different wavelengths. Let's concentrate down here to, in, on the submillimeter and millimeter wavelengths. So the other point I want to make is if you want to really explore these uh, wavelengths, I mean, from the ground, you can do uh, at about 2,000 meters, you can do up to uh, 0.8 millimeters. But if you want to go above that, like in the terahertz region, you really have to go to high uh, altitudes because of the atmospheric absorption. And even there, you only have windows. And if you really want to get rid of the atmospheric windows, then you have to go either in uh, the uh, at 10 or 12 kilometers, like with Sofia, or of course, in space. So let me here present uh, what are the instruments that are able to do that sort of work. Um, I will present you first uh, the single dish telescopes that are actually uh, working uh, as of today. And so you see there is a whole series of uh, instruments, some of them very old, like Ansela or Nobuyama, but also the IRAM 30 meter telescope and down to the uh, South Pole uh, with the South Pole telescope, the 10 meter. You will see that these instruments have played an incredible role in a major um, uh, uh, result that was obtained uh, uh, recently on a black hole. In terms of the uh, semi-meter interferometers, uh, today there are four active uh, in these domains. Uh, one is in Australia, but I don't want to talk too much about it. Uh, the other one is NOEMA, uh, the SMA in Hawaii, and then ALMA in, in Chile. Um, of course, uh, one thing that you have to keep in mind is that we are in a juncture today 
in astronomy with uh, very important instruments that are being uh, tested today, like the GWST, and will become uh, operational in a few months for providing fantastic results. The ELT that is uh, being done and the SK in the near future. So we really have to think about these instruments like interferometers in the frame of these uh, future instruments that will provide very critical synergies in terms of science that can be done. So let me first uh, talk about NOEMA. Uh, NOEMA stands for the Northern Extended Millimeter Array. It's an instrument from IRAM. And it was a project that, in fact, uh, we started when I was the director of IRAM, where we had the ambitious vision to double the number of antennas uh, from the Plateau de Beer from 6 to 12, and really literally replace all the equipment from the receivers uh, to the correlator, with particularly increasing the IF bandwidth from 8 to 16 gigahertz and covering uh, 3 to 0.8 millimeter atmospheric bands that are all available and observable from the Plateau de Beer. And then also to extend the baselines from 0.8 to 1.6 kilometers. So the first few bullets have all been done as of January, and we are currently extending, or IRAM is extending the baselines that will become available for next winter season. So here is a, a picture of the first antenna that was added on the six antennas in February 2015. And this is the current state in January 2020 with the 12 antennas on the plateau de Beer. And I must say, when I saw that picture, I was really moved because it was a dream come true. The Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, uh, also called ALMA, is an array of 66 antennas with 50 12 meter antennas and compact array of 12 17 meters and four dishes of 12 meters uh, using aperture synthesis. Uh, basically a zoom telescope as NOEMA. But because of the high altitude, it has the entire millimeter, sub-millimeter wavelengths up to one terahertz that is observable. So the antennas are at 5,000 meters or 16,000 feet or so. And uh, uh, you have an extended configuration up to 16 kilometers and a very compact one where the shortest baselines are about 180 meters or so. Um, it is operated from a, uh, the OSF, which is uh, at uh, 3,000 meters. And it has been built uh, to operate for more than 30 years. Or, and the first three antennas were uh, successfully operating in 2009. And today, the whole, base, uh, the whole array is operating as expected. Um, very complicated um, uh, maintenance may, uh, uh, and, and work there. But I think it's really a success story and probably one of the most incredible instruments in terms of production of science over the last few years. This is a view uh, seen from above uh, a few years ago, but it provides you a good uh, uh, over, over, overview of the uh, wonderful landscape where it is. And the whole plateau is at 5,000 meters. So a brief uh, work, word about interferometry. Uh, interferometry is really trying to mimic the equivalent of very big telescopes, uh, depending on the baseline, from 1.6 for NOEMA up to 16 kilometers in diameter for ALMA. Of course, building such a telescope isn't feasible because it will just crash under its own gravity and weight. And uh, so what you do is, instead of building one big telescope, you populate the surface or the virtual surface with individual antennas and as many as possible to be as efficient as possible. So uh, in the case of ALMA, it's 66 antennas. In the case of NOEMA, it's 12 antennas. So one of the important things here is you fill the surface, and it's filled with time, because the antenna change relative position with respect to the source when the Earth rotates. And hence, what you're doing here is to populate the uh, surface of the antenna uh, when you observe. And of course, more, the more antennas you have, the more efficient you have you be, but of course there is also a limit in the budget. And I will come uh, later at the end of my talk about a few comments about how things can be improved in terms of sensitivity and efficiency uh, for uh, both NOEMA and, and ALMA. So basically what it uh, allows you to have is high sensitivity and high angular resolution. Um, so you have receivers that are being built, uh, which are operating in the so-called atmospheric windows. And uh, NOEMA and ALMA have common windows, uh, bands, receivers up to 0.8 millimeters. Uh, the frequencies are given here. 
and in um, uh, in green are receivers that are being installed as we speak, and in blue under construction. As you see, Alma has bands that are at higher frequencies, up to 950 gigahertz or so, the bands 8, 9, and 10, that makes Alma uh, unique in its sense. Uh, one of the uh, points that I want to make here is that for Noema, the receivers have much larger bandwidths than Noema, uh, than Alma, sorry, and that provides additional um, scientific capabilities uh, that are uh, unique to Noema for the time being. So what are you doing with uh, the semi-millimeter, millimeter? And there are two main tracers. Uh, there are other ones, but the two main ones, first one is the continuum of the uh, dust emission. And as you have seen in my first picture, you have these uh, large patches of darkness, uh, which is not a place where there's no stars, but there are places where you have a lot of gas and dust, and the dust absorbs the stellar emission, and hence it radiates in the infrared, but it appears dark in the optical. So dust is only a small fraction of the, uh, all the components in the universe, but it's a very essential one um, because it's there where a lot of chemistry is happening, a lot of molecules are formed, and it's one of the basic constituents of the interstellar medium. Um, I like this little cartoon from the New Yorker where uh, two uh, women are cleaning an apartment and looking at the sky and say, oh my God, it's, uh, it's so beautiful, but I only can think about the dust there around. Of course, it can also, uh, in these uh, wavelengths, you have most of the uh, fundamental uh, transitions of a lot of molecules. And so it really opened uh, the field of astrochemistry and uh, you can uh, really detect and identify uh, the uh, uh, molecular richness of the interstellar medium uh, near and uh, far away. And uh, I think that is a field that really blossomed uh, particularly is uh, the opening of radio and millimeter astronomy and is a very important chapter of uh, modern astronomy. So what will and uh, is Noema and Alma doing? So basically we're studying the cosmic origins and it goes literally from the formation of the galaxies billions of years ago to the formation of stars in nearby galaxies and in our galaxy formation of planets around stars, the chemistry of clouds and new solar systems, including also, particularly for ALMA, the study of our own solar system. So what I will do here is to invite you uh, in a journey where I will start with the sun, because ALMA is capable of observing the sun and then going to the very first uh, galaxies that were formed in the early universe. So in the solar system here is a summary of what ALMA has been able to do. It, you see it's a lot of things from Venus to uh, the uh, satellites of uh, the, the, the big planets, uh, Mars, comets, and also uh, Pluto and uh, explorations of Kuiper Belt objects. Let me give you here a few uh, examples. And of course, I shouldn't forget here to also mention the sun. So let's start with the sun. This is an H-alpha image and taken some years ago. Uh, but this was the first image obtained uh, with ALMA of the sun at 650 gigahertz. Uh, this was done with a single antenna, but also, of course, it was done in interferometry. It's uh, really providing a unique probe of the chromosphere. And those are observations of a sunspot on December the 18th of 2015. And here you see the image obtained with the interferometer with all the details that you are wishing for and uh, providing uh, a uh, interesting view of the cold chromosphere part of, uh, of, this, of, of our sun. It also provides wonderful results on, uh, uh, on uh, the planets. And here is one example of an image of uh, Jupiter seen in the transition of ammonia, providing a wonderful probe of the atmosphere below 15 kilo, uh, 50 kilometers or so, um, and providing uh, very important information about the uh, connection and all the structure of the atmosphere in Jupiter. Let me now go to uh, nearby uh, regions of star formation. And here is a uh, broad summary of what is happening when you have a uh, molecular cloud collapsing and forming um, a disk uh, about three uh, million years later. And, uh, and then um, you have uh, the evolution of that disk. And after 50 mega years or so, you do have the formation of planets. So the important thing here is to really try to probe all these different phases. And I think the beauty of um, 
uh, sub-millimeter, millimeter, millimeter uh, instruments is that you really can look at all these different phases which are so important in star formation and try to understand and connect all these different phases by looking at different objects. So the other point that I would like to make and which is also I think key in the study of uh, uh, when you use a millimeter seven millimeter facilities is the big question about how to go from dust, how you form dust and you go to bigger and bigger uh, sizes up to planets. And um, so everything which is below millimeter can be done in the millimeter centimeter observations. And then you have planets uh, in the range for above the kilometer or so. But of course, in between, you have the barrier of growth and radial drift and fragmentation. And there's a big question here, how do things evolve and particularly how you come from smaller dust grains, bigger dust grains, and then you form and, 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 and form these big uh, objects, uh, one of which where we are living on. So here is a, a, a little video that is a model uh, showing the formation of a star with the collapse of the uh, molecular cloud and then uh, the flattening at the center and then the gradual formation of the star with all the um, um, subsequent uh, activities uh, with jets and uh, spiral arms and a lot of incredible structure which was in fact uh, first seen by the models and that, as you will see today, today particularly Alma has um, shown to be um, as the models has expected, but I think even better, it's much better than every model has expected. Much richer, much more divisive. So in terms of star formation, one of the uh, obvious activities is the uh, outflows, the jets. And here is one example why uh, it's so important to do millimeter or sub-millimeter astronomy. It's um, uh, observations is the example of a outflow in the system at HH6447, where you see the optical image and you see clearly there is uh, outflow activity here. You only see part of it because you cannot really peer through the um, uh, dark cloud. And uh, this is the image obtained with Alma some time ago in 2013, is one of the first examples. But I'd like to show it because it really shows the complementarity between uh, infrared optical and the uh, millimeter, sub millimeter. And there, there you get the full view of the whole system. Um, another example of uh, a complementary view this is a Muse image of uh, Orion uh, with the Orion uh, bar in the south here and the Trezium star is in the middle. And this is the same about the same view here, but seen with Alma and in the uh, uh, tracing the activity of the very massive stars. And this is uh, this beautiful image where you uh, see a lot of filaments and particularly a lot of activity around the massive stars of the Orion uh, Nebula, which are ejecting matter very far away with different uh, uh, velocities. And uh, clearly when you go from here to there, it is a completely different view, but complementary and providing um, absolutely crucial information about the dynamics and the interaction in these complex um, systems. Um, let me now go to a little zooming of the uh, uh, photo dissociation region, the bar. And here's the view of the bar uh, measured with ALMA together with the 30 meter telescope to recuperate the uh, uh, large scale emission. So you see here the molecular gas in one tracer, HCO plus four to three, the ionized gas and the very small grains uh, uh, measured from space. And what you see here is a real view of what I call a molecular cloud with all the structure, with all the differences and the different, uh, the transparency, the shining and the interaction between the very hard radiation, the UV radiation, and the molecular cloud and the dust. Another view of Orion is the spectacular image obtained not with an interferometer with, with a 30 meter of IRAM uh, with an instrument called AMIR. It is a huge map that was obtained after many hundreds of hours at a telescope uh, measuring and mapping the entire region and different molecules. And particularly here you see a mix of uh, CO in uh, one to zero, but it's the uh, 12 CO, the 13 CO, and the C18 CO, so all the isotopes with the different colors. And you see here the structure of uh, the um, cloud. Of course, uh, these, uh, these uh, tracers also provide you information about the velocity and its uh, a richness that is 
beyond imagination, in fact, and uh, the authors of this paper have had um, 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 the help of um, artificial intelligence to really understand the complexity of this mind, of this of, of this region and the information that was gained through these many hours of observation. But I think it's a very nice illustration of the new type of science that can be done with that type of instruments, uh, thanks to the broadband receivers, the multi uh, pixel receivers, etc. In these wavelengths. Let me now go to the other uh, important uh, aspect of uh, ALMA particularly is uh, the whole field of protoplanetary disks. Uh, this is a view of pre-ALMA that was obtained with also with telescopes uh, with Owens Valley, uh, with the SMA, uh, with uh, the Plateau de Beer. And uh, you see here that the disks around the young stars were clearly detected, but uh, with not many information about the details of the morphology. So just to um, um, underline uh, the huge progress that was made with ALMA, he had the same objects as seen with ALMA. And as you can see, it's really then uh, night, if I may say so. And uh, the first one that was done was HL Tau, that was observed in fact with the um, uh, long baselines when they were first uh, tested uh, back in 2013. Uh, with great success. And I can still remember the first time I saw that picture that nobody could really believe what we saw and people were even thinking that it was due to artificial uh, effects and uh, a, a bad understanding of the behavior of the telescopes. Um, what I also want to point out here is that all these, in, um, all these objects are very diverse, uh, diversified. They show different uh, uh, morphologies like uh, spiral arms here in, in Elias uh, 227, uh, multiple objects like in L1448, uh, multiple rings, uh, etc. So uh, I think it was a real um, richness here. And um, of course, uh, many other observations have been done. And here's uh, a, a few examples of a, a, a large program that has made where you see again uh, the diversity of uh, these objects and the richness of information one can get. Um, so of course, one of the big questions that uh, came up immediately is, was, is the origin in particular of the rings that you see. And uh, uh, if, uh, as people said, it's um, a uh, indication that you have planets being formed. And uh, if planets are close, uh, causing these gaps, then they are below Jupiter masses. What is very nice, I think, is that there have been hydrodynamical simulations where you have coupled gas and dust evolution on the bottom here, and you really see that the model reproduces very well the ALMA observations. And uh, so I think it is uh, very clear, in my mind at least, that there is a clear link between the planet formation and the gaps. But there are all sort of uh, subtleties here. I don't want to go into the details and clearly uh, the observations uh, provide the uh, foundation upon which uh, our understanding about how planets are formed uh, will evolve and progress in the, in the future. So not only uh, the images I showed you were all done in the dust continuum, but only not only do you see dust, but you can also look at molecules. It's more difficult, it, it, it requires more time, but this has uh, really progressed over the last few years. And this is a recent um, a summary of um, a, a program maps uh, by uh, Karin Ölberg and uh, collaborators where you see on the top the uh, dust emission, again, a high variety of uh, morphologies. And on the bottom here, <clears throat> the distributions of uh, different molecules, uh, HC3N, CH3CN, and uh, cyclic C3H2. You see complicated molecules existing in these, uh, um, uh, in these disks. Uh, not only providing information about the chemistry, but also providing uh, invaluable information about the kinematics. So let me now go uh, into uh, the uh, clouds and the systems that provide the uh, uh, the location where stars are formed or the, con the conditions uh, where these stars are formed. And uh, those clouds are incredibly complex and also harbor, harbor a, a in, an incredible complex um, chemistry. And um, not only that, but uh, during their collapse, there is a very, um, uh, I would say complicated evolution of the gas and the dust to the smaller scales, 
uh, because of the variation of the physical conditions uh, during all these uh, um, uh, episodes. So the questions that are when we can ask is uh, where what molecules are formed as the material is accreted to a circumstellar disk and how and how is the rich chemistry of the earliest protostellar stages incorporated into the emerging planetary systems. So this is an example in the row of Fucius of a well-known um, uh, very dark cloud, uh, IRS 16293 uh, minus 2422, as detected by the IRS satellite, uh, satellite sometime. And it's um, uh, very well-known because first of all, it's um, uh, nearby, it's a low mass protostellar binary, and it's a astrochemical template where, in fact, the first detections of complex organics uh, were done, uh, including uh, glycoaldehyde. So, um, interesting program by Alma was to look at this uh, source and do a unbiased uh, full uh, 0.8 uh, millimeter, so 220, 260 gigahertz um, survey of the uh, and understand what the uh, chemistry was in this and the molecular complexity. Um, so there were about 20 hours here. And the um, sensitivity is such that you can detect species with abundances that are about uh, 0.01% um, relative to methanol. So about 10 to the minus 11 or 10 to the minus 12 relative to molecular hydrogen. So this is the result of this uh, spectrum. A lot of um, uh, emission lines. Uh, 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 and uh, to put that in prospect, there are more than 10,000 separate lines a few percent from smaller non-organic molecules and one third from known saturated organic molecules, and one third of isotopic variants of those organic molecules. So a quite amazing richness for a cold um, uh, molecular cloud, a dark cloud, and uh, with increasing complexity and uh, with detections of complicated molecules, acetone, propanol, acetaldenine, ethylene oxide, and uh, which were previously only seen towards a very few selected sources. And clearly, isomers are important tests for chemical models and laboratory experiments. And um, the uh, an analysis of those data, plus other data taken in the meantime, are essential to really understand the uh, basics and fundamental physics and chemistry happening in these collapsing cores. Um, another interesting example of a star forming region where phosphorus was found, a PO and also PN, those are key prebiotic species, was uh, found in a massive star forming uh, region, AFGL 5142. And uh, those species are interesting because they're also found in a comet uh, with the name here, measured by Rosina and Rosetta, proving a strong link between comets and life on Earth. So the chemistry that we see in these dark clouds, uh, I think is very essential to understand the link and how it evolves towards the chemistry seen in protoplanetary nebula, and then also make the link to the comets and of course, uh, the ingredients on Earth that provided uh, the seeds uh, for um, the emergence of life. Um, just one example of uh, dust formation, I think it's very important. Uh, this is a wonderful result of a map of uh, the supernova SN 1987A uh, done with ALMA. You see it here on the bottom. And I think it was the first time that there was a real uh, uh, detailed map made of the dust that was uh, made in uh, the supernova explosion with a good uh, measurement of the dust mass. And I think one of the key questions here, and I will come back into my talk about this, is the yield of uh, supernova dust formation and the understanding about how dust is formed in the early galaxies when uh, normal stars like AGD stars don't have the time to evolve uh, to make the dust. So we rely only on supernova remnants to make the dust. So uh, let me now go and jump into uh, the field of the nearby galaxy. So we uh, leave our own galaxy. And I will start with a, a very detailed study uh, of uh, nearby galaxies uh, here, starting with F M51. Those are results that were obtained with the then Plateau de Greer plus um, uh, gradually also the antennas of NOEMA, um, a project done by Eva Schinner and uh, collaborators, where you see M51 here. In red, you see the atomic hydrogen. In the background, you see the HST image. And in Blue, you see the uh, carbon monoxide and the CO1 to zero emission. And you see it's done, uh, there is, uh, it's done with very high angular resolution. 
there are many hundreds of hours that were spent on doing this together with 30 meter telescope time to get the um, uh, extended emission. And uh, what you really see here is a very detailed uh, study of gas that are in the spiral arms, in between the sterile arms and in the center, plus all the kinematics as is shown here. So this is a view again of the HST and the um, uh, CO only. And here you have the CO one to zero. Uh, and here you have uh, the velocity field. Um, I think there were something like uh, 1,500 molecular clouds that were identified. You can look at the properties, the variations of properties with respect to the location with interarm, arm, center, et cetera, and very far away. And then also the merging uh, with the atomic gas. So again, a richness of data here. And that work has been continued using ALMA. And here are examples of a few galaxies and a FANGS survey. Um, you see a richness of data again, uh, not only one object, but 19 objects have been measured like this, together with complementary data, particularly observed with the VLT, uh, VLT you only use to look at the stars at the uh, emission of uh, compact H2 regions, extended H2 regions, and uh, to give you an idea about the um, beauty of these data, here are examples of uh, two galaxies, I forgot their name, where you see in red, in fact, the, uh, uh, the distribution of the molecular gas and in back here, news, and here is the same for another galaxy, which is, I think, NGC 1033. So here again, you have a wonderful example of what can be done with ALMA in terms of um, um, detailing the physics of the individual molecular clouds and the relation with the stellar component, the variation of one to the other, looking at feedback mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that is allowed by this, uh, let's say, panchromatic um, study of uh, nearby galaxies. Um, galaxies are also very rich in, um, in molecules. And here is one example of a uh, galaxy, NGC 253, where you see maps uh, obtained in various um, uh, molecules. Uh, there's about 50 lines that were detected over a full width of 13 gigahertz, with 27 identified and 13 tentative. What I think is very interesting is if you look at all these different tracers, you always see that they're tracing something quite different. And basically, they're all uh, sensitive to various physical conditions, and hence you're tracing regions of the nucleus and the photo dissociation regions, dense gas, the shocks, and the outflows, providing not only information about the chemistry, but also uh, invaluable information about the physical conditions. Now, let me go to a, uh, another uh, nice uh, recent result obtained uh, not only with NOEMA and ALMA, but with a whole suite of instruments working in the millimeter, submillimeter. So as you know, um, galaxies harbor in their center uh, massive black holes. And these massive black holes have uh, at times a very uh, um, um, explosive, uh, very energetic, uh, um, um, sequences where they eject outflows, as seen here in the case of uh, the um, Hercules A uh, galaxy, where you see in the radio uh, that there is a large symmetrical jet that is stretching out to about 1.5 million uh, light years or so, uh, powered by the central black hole. And here you have the image in the X-rays uh, where you see uh, the uh, gas of the around the galaxy that has been heated by these jets. So uh, that's one example, and of course there are many other ones. And one of the uh, key, uh, I think, goals of astronomy is to really understand the physics around the black hole and try to do as best as possible to observe them. But of course, this is very difficult. And around a black hole, there is a so-called event horizon, uh, which is the uh, uh, horizon beyond which nothing can be seen and nothing can escape. And uh, the sizes of these horizons, for instance, for our own galaxy, in the, the center of our galaxy, a star, is about 10 micro arc seconds. And you see here two models of what you would expect to see an emission at 230 gigahertz um, uh, with different uh, physical conditions here. Basically, what you see is the um, shadow, I mean, the, 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 the event horizon, which is shining, and then against the uh, uh, completely black uh, center of, of the black hole. So the project to measure that was a project that started uh, about a decade ago and used a lot of efforts and organization uh, to bring together 
uh, many telescopes because if you want to really have an angular resolution of about a few 10 micro arc seconds, even with ALMA, that's impossible. But what you can do is to use all these telescopes that are spread around on the world and use them and combine them so that you have baselines that extend over the size of the Earth up to about uh, 10,000 kilometers, reaching uh, hence uh, the uh, required uh, angular resolution. So that was successfully done on the case of M87, and you will soon hear uh, results about the center of our galaxy uh, next week, I think. And uh, so this is a view of uh, M87, and you see it's a uh, normal galaxy, but if you look at clearly in the center, there is ongoing activity here. And this is the radio where you see it's very complex, uh, a lot of activity uh, due to the central black hole. Uh, this is a jet that is linked in a black hole, and I'm going to zoom gradually. There was different experiments. Uh, this is in the radio. You see the, uh, the jet in the both sides here. And then here you start to see better and better. This is a VLBI. This is the best that could be done in the centimeter. And then finally, this is the result that was obtained that you have seen uh, with all these instruments that I've shown before, um, with in the case of M87. And you clearly see uh, what the models predicted. Um, so you see the black hole in, in, this, in the center as a shadow, and around it, the um, event horizon uh, um, uh, clearly uh, shining uh, like um, a, a diamond. Um, so this is a, a cartoon about uh, what you see here. You have the relativistic jet, you rent horizon, the singularity here, the photons here, and the innermost stable orbit. So I think that's a really uh, wonderful example of collaboration between many institutions and many telescopes. Now, let me jump further in our journey through uh, uh, cosmic time. And uh, uh, I will try to, in the last uh, 15 minutes or so uh, to summarize some of the salient results obtained uh, in our probing of the early universe. This is the whole chapter in itself. I could speak for two hours on it, and I will try to just provide you a brief uh, summary. Um, clearly, uh, what is uh, uh, driving uh, all these activities is to really go uh, into cosmic time uh, towards the uh, uh, dark ages, the rainization, the galaxy buildup, and trying to understand the connection of all this, um, trying to link uh, the observations with modeling, and uh, trying to see how well we can uh, really probe all these different uh, uh, galaxies, understand their conditions, understand fundamental questions, for instance, about the evolution with cosmic time, or, for instance, also how dust is formed, how these big galaxies are formed, how you also, for instance, um, form very massive black holes in the early universe, what are the scenes, etc. So, many ways to do that, and one of them is to uh, look at individual sources that have been, for instance, measured and obtained, uh, identified within the optical near infrared with the VLT, for instance. And then look at uh, those uh, normal galaxies uh, with uh, uh, 80 parameters, in this case, uh, with Noema and the Plateau de Beer. Those are examples of <coughs> redshift galaxies at 1.2 or so, uh, with resolutions in between 0.3 and 0.7 arcs um, second resolution. Uh, you see here the maps. You clearly <coughs> see that the galaxies are resolved. You see the velocity field. We can do a lot of incredible good science here, but one point that I want to make here is that these observations are very costly in time because uh, they are weak and it needs many, many, many hours uh, to obtain these results. But I think it's incredibly important to do this and to really dedicate uh, I mean, telescope time to really probe these normal galaxies. So, of course, I mean, you only have the resolution that you have here. And uh, to go further, uh, we have the um, uh, ability to look into uh, greater details using the effect of gravitation amplification, where in between you and the uh, galaxy that is far away, there is a massive foreground galaxy that plays the role of a lens and uh, distorts and amplifies the background emission. So this is uh, one example here, one of the first obtained with ALMA, where you see clearly a ring uh, and the foreground galaxy in blue here. So let me show you uh, one of my favorite sources, which is ID81. It's a little dot here seen in the Herschel uh, survey, HATLAS survey, 
um, uh, where you see <clears throat> thousands of galaxies, tens of thousands of galaxies, but you see also very bright ones that are um, highlighted here that are very clearly examples of galaxies that are uh, amplified. So ID81 is uh, one of them, it's SPD81, it's a redshift of three. This is what you see with the HST. So what you see basically is a foreground galaxy and you don't see the background galaxy. And this is the result obtained with ALMA. Again, uh, one example of a result obtained in the long baseline uh, campaign in 2013 that was so, so successful. And that was obtained with, I think, 14 kilometers and many, many hours of submission. What you see here is a mix of dust emission and many molecules, CO and also water. So here is uh, the result of when you apply a model uh, to these uh, exquisite data and uh, you see the uh, emission in the source plane with uh, resolutions, uh, linear resolutions that are about in between 50 and 100 parsec. So corresponding to the sizes of molecular clouds in our own galaxy, but here at a redshift of three. Of course, you need extremely good uh, quality data to be able to do such models and retrieve the information at that scale. So here is another uh, uh, presentation of these uh, data and to derive the models here. And I just want to show you what you can do. You really clearly also see the, uh, um, the dynamics and uh, you see here a rotation curve, but also you see that the, uh, that galaxy is very complex and fragmented. Another way to look at uh, high Z galaxies is to look uh, for a long, long time at one little spot in the sky as the Hubble Space Telescope did and the Hubble Deep Field, which is probably one of the fields that is the most uh, observed with uh, multi wavelengths from the optical and the near infrared and the radio and et cetera. And, uh, <clears throat> and to look at that also uh, in the millimeter, submillimeter, to try to pick out from the, the sources that you see here in the optical to the left uh, what you can see and what you can detect in the millimeter, submillimeter, which you see here on the right. So, what you see on the right is a continuum map which is probably the deepest continuum map ever obtained in centimeter, millimeter astronomy. Um, the uh, RMS is about, uh, uh, the noise is about nine micro Janskis uh, per beam. And uh, you clearly see that there's a lot of sources that are detected, all seen in, in, in yellow. But one of the things that is obvious if you compare with the optical is that the number of sources seen in the millimeter, centimeter is way down to what you observe in the optical near infrared. So, uh, this program, which is called Aspects, not only looked at the continuum, but also did spectral surveys uh, for all the, um, all the field. And this is uh, shown here, it was done in band three and band six. So you see all the little dots here, and uh, which are the sources, and then sources here are seen, for instance, in the right. The lines are the continuum, and um, which is uh, very interesting because you can then also measure the, uh, the redshifts and then derive uh, the different lines that you detect physical conditions. So here are examples of these uh, sources. Of course, the resolution is not uh, that high. Uh, what was important is the sensitivity. And, uh, but you see clearly that these sources were detected. And uh, what is important is it provides, in fact, a, a foundation uh, to study uh, the evolution of the, um, um, uh, the gas density with uh, cosmic time and compare it with, for instance, the, the, the stellar evolution, et cetera. So this is a summary of uh, the evolution of the molecular gas density uh, with time. And then to the right, you have some sort of prediction if uh, what the trends that we see uh, are continuing as we see it, and so forecasting what will happen in the future. So basically uh, what you uh, see here is um, that uh, the, uh, the evolution of the baryonic mass components uh, averaged over cosmic time, and that the yellow line that indicates the stellar mass, uh, which is increasing, and the blue line is the molecular gas reservoir from which the stars are formed. And uh, <clears throat> it, uh, both speak at about redshifts of two or three, uh, which is the uh, peak of cosmic evolution. And if these trends are extrapolated into the future, then the cosmic density will um, um, uh, constantly the decline and the uh, growth of the stellar um, uh, mass will gradually becoming significant. So let me now finish with a, a few examples of the richness of chemistry in high Z galaxies. 
Uh, this is a work in preparation by Shantao Yang. It shows two examples of uh, one quasar, APM 08279, and another starburst galaxy, uh, where you see that uh, both uh, it was done with NOIMA, uh, uh, so full spectral uh, survey at the three millimeter. And what you see is that the richness of lines here is akin to what you see also in uh, local galaxies. A lot of water, of course, uh, the CO lines, the C1 lines, uh, the water lines, but also the other lines, CCH, H2SO, et cetera, et cetera, out of which you can do a lot of physics. But also not only that, but you can sort of compare between the two sources. And there are absolutely genuine important differences uh, which are indicating the activity of the quasars in terms of the excitations of the uh, molecular gas. Um, another example of a survey where a unexpected result came out is the case of HFLS3, or the redshift of 6.3. And perhaps you've seen that paper in Nature this year, which is a measurement, direct measurement of the temperature of the cosmic background, the microwave background at that particular redshift. And so this is a cartoon where you see the, uh, up, uh, the antennas of uh, Noema you observe that source at a redshift at 6.3, which is about 880 million years after the Big Bang. And you see as a shadow, in fact, uh, 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 using water, and I explained in a minute, uh, the imprint of the cosmic background, and then you can measure the temperature. So what was done is to cover a band which was not covered in the past uh, to understand the molecular richness of this galaxy. And here is the... Uh, 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 the obtained result <coughs> in the uh, uh, three milliliter band with NOIMA. Again, you see that the spectrum is dominated by CO lines, of course, but there's a lot of lines of uh, um, H2O, H2O plus C1. But the most spectacular result and unexpected result was that we see a very strong absorption of the fundamental transition of water, the 110101. But not only that, but it goes below zero and into the cosmic background um, uh, emission. So what is happening here? So this is a, a brief summary, and I don't want to enter too much into the details. But what is happening here is that at those redshifts, uh, the expected uh, temperature of the cosmic background, uh, basically on lambda CDM, is about uh, 20 K or so, and uh, so that to thermalize the uh, fundamental transition of the water. But then comes in the fact that you look into a starburst, which emits uh, um, uh, photons in the infrared, and uh, you have a, um, uh, uh, a sort of a, a play here with uh, uh, photons at 808 micron uh, that populate and uh, depopulate the 110 level and populate the 221. And that uh, creates an imbalance here, and hence you have an absorption, and this is what you observe. So uh, basically, it's a bit complicated. This has also been completely modeled in Radax or whatever. <clears throat> the result, uh, uh, to summarize, is that you can measure with, it's, it's, it's not easy, it's model dependent, and it also depends on how good you understand the background source. But you can measure, you have an, have an idea about the temperature of the cosmic background at redshift 6.3 precisely. And uh, <clears throat> the <clears throat> method, and the model also is predictable, it can be tested, and we have now currently measured other sources, and we have uh, proved that that method is working, and we have now other measurements. So it is, I think, a wonderful thing to go beyond what was done until now with the SZ effect or other effects in absorption of quasars, which were less um, um, uh, reliable, and to really go at much higher redshift, about above four or so, and explore the uh, early universe, and we can do that up to redshifts of 12 uh, using that method. So basically, you use water to measure the temperature of the cosmic background. So a nice result from Noema, I think. Um, let me finish with the uh, um, hunting of the uh, farthest away uh, galaxies. Uh, there are many quasars now that have been found at redshift 6, 7, and uh, the uh, hunt continues. And uh, this is the farther away, most distant galaxy candidate yet, uh, which was recently published at a redshift of 13.3. I think I have problems pronouncing it correctly uh, because it's so astonishing. And it is a, a galaxy that was found um, detected <coughs> in the H dropout climate break um, with a Subaru after many hundreds of hours of observations. And <coughs> this is the um, tentative detection of the O3 line 
a, a, a fine structure line, atomic fine structure line, <coughs> shifted in a 238 gigahertz from um, the terahertz regime. And uh, <coughs> um, so it's tentative, but it's really indicative that uh, that galaxy is indeed probably at 13.3. Very clearly, I mean, those galaxies will be followed up with a GWST and provide a completely new view <coughs> of the galaxies in the very, very early universe. So, sorry. I'm going to summarize my journey here, where we literally um, traveled from Redshift Zero, from our sun, uh, through our galaxy, uh, star forming regions, uh, places where planets are formed, um, supernova remnants, and then nearby galaxies, uh, trying to understand and the, 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 the in, in incredible complexity and the relationship between the different structures, the properties of the uh, molecular clouds, uh, the relation with the star formation, the feedback, and then uh, go further and further, um, looking at uh, deeper in the uh, around the black hole, and then gradually probing uh, galaxies at higher and higher redshift uh, into the ionization area up to redshift of 13.3 or so. So if you look into the future, I think that uh, these studies will have a boost in the coming years uh, with, of course, the upcoming JWST, which is uh, functioning, I think, wonderfully well. I heard the other day that the uh, expected lifetime now of the JWST will be 20 years. So much more than the uh, nominal five years that was expected, uh, thanks to the uh, wonderful launch of, uh, the uh, of this uh, telescope. And I think it will, together with ALMA, uh, revolutionize uh, our understanding of um, the high Z universe, but also of uh, nearby um, uh, regions where planets are formed. But if you look down the road, there's uh, particularly the VLT, but also the SKA, the NGVLA. So there's a lot of instruments in the near future and the far future that will provide um, a means to observe all these uh, different objects and the phases of the cosmic evolution in greater and greater detail. And I think that it's important to keep in mind that uh, particularly for ALMA, but also for NOIMA in the future, it is key to continue to upgrade these instruments because it's possible to do that. And you have seen the example of NOIMA where before there were only six antennas, today it's double so much with a completely new suite of receivers, correlator, providing all the means to do better. There's a lot of things that are foreseen for NOIMA, for instance, doing dual, dual frequency, providing even larger bandwidths to explore the uh, contents of faraway galaxies or nearby galaxies. And I think in ALMA, there is a lot of things uh, uh, foreseen. Uh, the uh, uh, augmentation of the bandwidth of the receivers, a new correlator, but I would also say it is important to think about adding additional antennas uh, because it will not only provide you with a better sensitivity, but also provide you with a much more efficient array um, that will completely take advantage of the very long baselines and use them much more than we do today. And in addition, also use the high frequency bands that are windows, which are not so well um, used and exploited and that provide completely new windows into our uh, understanding of uh, our universe. So after these uh, wrapping up uh, sentences, I would like to finish with two beautiful pictures of uh, Noema taken uh, back uh, in, uh, in January. And then uh, on the bottom here, a wonderful picture of uh, Alma providing you the sense of the beauty of the landscape where it is. So I would like to thank you for your attention and your patience. And again, uh, thank you so much for having given me the opportunity to give this talk. So we'll stop sharing. Yeah, okay. I hope I wasn't. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Professor Cox, for you know giving me such a wonderful uh, talk. And I must say that each slide is uh, um, I mean, so amazing to see all these AMA and NOEMA results. It is revealing the universe the way we thought in textbook, actually. And also, you know, giving a lot of uh, scope for the new research that may come up this, from these uh, images. It's yeah. In a, yeah. So adding a lot of complexity and to think about the new questions that we may be able to answer in future.
So I think it's time for uh, question answer section. Uh, for that, I would like to invite uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Shashikran Ganesh, to conduct the question answer session. Over to you, Dr. Ganesh. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Manan. Uh, I'll just move to the screen. And uh, so, yeah, thanks, Professor Cox, uh, for this uh, wonderful uh, feast of <laughs> result. <laughs> It was really fascinating looking at the vast dynamic range, starting from the sun and right up to the, you know, uh, just millions of years just after the formation of the universe, after the formation of the Big Bang. So wonderful results. Uh, I just uh, had one quick question before we open the floor to the rest of the uh, WebEx. Um, so I was wondering like about the site selection criteria for uh, Alma and Noema. So how does one go about picking this kind of a site? Uh, you mentioned the altitude, of course, but then apart from that, what are the parameters? So I think that uh, in um, uh, to answer uh, the, the most recent one, Alma, uh, there were two um, considerations. Is The first one is the altitude, because people wanted to really go to very high frequency. I recall you that uh, Historically, ALMA is a combination of uh, three different uh, projects that were supported by uh, uh, Asia, uh, and, uh, the, the US and uh, Europe. And uh, there was a lot of back and forth where uh, people wanted to go to, for instance, the, uh, the uh, American project was really to go to small telescopes to do high frequency. And I think uh, Aram uh, demonstrated that you could do also large dishes that were very, very good in quality and uh, with which you could also do high frequency. So it was combined and uh, uh, it was a mix between seven meter and 15 meters, uh, leading to 12 meter antennas. And so the site, uh, of course, if you wanted to go to high frequency, you had to go to high uh, altitudes. And uh, it was shown by uh, previous measurements that the uh, Atacama Desert was at 5,000 meter was an ideal place. The other aspect that I think is very important to keep in mind is that also, uh, not only should it be high, but it should also prevent a flat ground where you could expand the antennas as much as possible. And in that sense, the uh, Chasantar um, uh, uh, plateau is a unique uh, site. Uh, it's only um, uh, the only other place that I can think of where this is possible is the South Pole. But of course, Installing Alma in the South Pole was, for logistical reasons, very difficult. Right. Yeah. And so for Noema, uh, that's a long story as well. But as you know, it's an uh, uh, it's, uh, institute that was founded by, uh, from, by the Germans and uh, the French, and then uh, Spain came uh, uh, in it. Uh, it's a long story. Uh, the, the Germans only wanted to have a single dish. The French wanted to have an interferometer. And uh, so basically, at the end, it made the right decision to have both. <laughs> And uh, and so they installed the uh, 30 meter in, as in the south because uh, the uh, director of that time at the Max Planck, uh, Metzger, wanted absolutely to measure the galactic center. So Spain was good. And the French wanted to have it in France. And it was also there a wonderful place, uh, the Plateau de Beer, at, not at 5,000 meter, but 2,500. It's also a plateau, as you have seen, where you could extend the interferometer. So the same. Um, argument as for the, for Alma. Mm -hmm. Nice, yeah. I've been to the IRAM 30 meter and I can really uh, appreciate the vastness of it. Now yeah. I request uh, people who have questions to please raise your hands. Uh, I think there's one question from Bala. Bala, can you please unmute and uh, ask your question? So Dr. Bala is an uh, astrochemist, actually, and oh. uh, he's doing a uh, lab astrochemistry. OK, so he says that his mic has issues. So his question is, uh, in the Noema antennas, how do they clean the snow inside the antenna? Oh. <laughs> um, as always, I mean, when, when it's uh, the, the basic rule is when it's snowing, you turn the antennas uh, with the back uh, to the wind. So that really? it's not uh, snowed in too much, but um, as soon as the uh, snow stopped, then uh, people go and, uh, and, and, and right. basically melt it. Yeah, it's the same thing with the thirty meter. And uh, I think the snow is an easy thing, which is much more complicated is this ice. Yeah, right. Okay. But the same question, of course, applies to Alma. 
and uh, where uh, after a snowstorm is always a rush because um, there's also statistically after the snowstorm there are the best weather conditions and so uh, one tries to um, be as quick as possible to clean the antennas and make them available for observations right okay Thanks. Uh, Professor Ashok Ambastal uh, has a question for you. Professor Ashok, can you please unmute and ask a question? Yeah, so, can you please? Yeah. 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 yeah, it was a wonderful talk. Uh, and I have a <clears throat> simple uh, curiosity about uh, how far back, you know, for example, here you uh, mentioned that you can. Uh, uh, actually, uh, identify as far back as 13.3 uh, billion uh, year back, you know, the the structures close to the origin of the universe. And uh, recently, for example, we have this web, uh, James Webb te uh, Telescope. So I was wondering how far one is expected to go back uh, farther than this or, uh, uh, you know, I think that uh, your, your question is a very good one, uh, and I, I would say as a first answer that people try to go as far as possible. Uh, the problem is to identify the sources uh, far away, and it will be it, it's very difficult, uh, particularly from the ground. And I think in that sense, uh, the James Webb Telescope will certainly provide a, a new um, opportunity to um, explore with incredible, um, exquisite sensitivity and probe into the um, in, in, in deep fields, like in Cosmos, for instance, uh, where you could expect to see uh, sources very far away. Uh, that being said, the follow up with ALMA are, uh, will be um, very complicated because you won't expect to have like uh, some of these uh, very luminous starbursts that I've shown. There may be more normal galaxy, there's not much gas, and, uh, and so it may be very difficult to follow that up uh, uh, in either in the dust or in, in the molecules. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the jury is out and there are a lot of expectations and surprises, I think. Uh, we still don't understand really the uh, uh, detailed process and the timelines of uh, the formation of gas, of dust. It could be much quicker than we think in certain environments. and. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, let's be open and see what happens. But clearly the James uh, Webb Telescope uh, <clears throat> will, I think, uh, provide um, uh, exquisite uh, new constraints in, on that important topic. Okay, thank you. Another, <clears throat> another question which I have is about, uh, uh, you know, the spiral structures uh, like uh, feature which you showed about the molecular clouds, you know, uh, in the early part of your talk today, uh, mm -hmm. quite a few examples where you can see molecular clouds, uh, uh, their presence uh, very close to the center of the, uh, you know, gal different galaxies, which you showed. So I was wondering whether, uh, uh, you know, the expectation would be the most of the molecular clouds are basically consumed in the form forming of uh, formation of the stars as you go uh, toward the central part of the uh, galaxies. So, so I was just wondering about uh, these cases which you showed where uh, quite a few molecular clouds seem to be existing uh, close to the center. So can you throw some light on that? Uh, I think that's a very good question. I mean, uh, it's a little bit outside of my uh, um, field of expertise, but from what I know, I mean, uh, it's very clearly, I mean, the data that I've seen, have shown, for instance, from, uh, 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 what is it called, uh, Foes or uh, Shangs, uh, clearly show you that there is a, a whole range of uh, uh, different molecular uh, clouds uh, if you go across a galaxy from the very center to the uh, spiral arms and in, in between the spiral arms. And there's also a link uh, with the history of the star formation, uh, with the history of the feedback, etc. Particularly, I think in the center, you have all sort of quenching phenomena, depending on uh, what the activity is there, if there's an AGN, not an AGN, etc., outflows, and uh, that also impacts uh, the properties of the molecular clouds. Um, so I think that uh, my uh, 
answer to that is that from what I have seen and understand is that we're entering today in a, in a, in a realm where you really look into molecular clouds with uh, you know, angular resolution, spatial resolutions are about a few 10 parsecs or so over the whole system. And uh, at the same time, you have the information about the stars, about the H2 regions, about the uh, you know, different tracers of the atomic gas and the ionized gas. And linking all that together is uh, being done as we speak. And uh, I think there's a lot of things that we're going to learn. I mean, there's clearly already uh, basic results coming out, but uh, the details are still uh, being looked at. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Cox. OK, uh, so Professor Cox, the next question is from uh, Dr. Viresh. Uh, Viresh, if you would please unmute. So Dr. Viresh is our AGN and high redshift galaxy person. So please, Viresh, go ahead. Hey, thank you, Professor Cox, for a nice presentation. Uh, you spoke about uh, very long baseline interferometry experiment, this event horizon telescope, uh, and uh, this, this uh, which detected this, uh, you know, accretion disk around M87. I was wondering that, uh, you know, uh, whether there are any successful attempts to uh, do the same thing for uh, Sagittarius A star, our own, you know, galactic center. So uh, what I can tell you is that when A87 was measured, uh, the galactic center was also measured. Okay. Uh, the, um, um, and again, I mean, the um, uh, Event Horizon Telescope was built at the beginning to really do the galaxy, uh, our galaxy, uh, Sagittarius A star. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why uh, M87 was published first is that the data reduction was easier. I think that uh, there are two um, issues with our own galaxy and the black hole in the center of Sagittarius A star. It's first of all that you look into the galactic plane and since you have effects of scintillations that you have to correct for. And the second thing is that there's a time variability uh, which is pretty high, uh, I think, uh, of uh, time scales are about 10 minutes or so. And so that has to be taken into account also. But from what I understand, and I don't know much more, but I know that there will be a press conference uh, next week on May the 12th, where you can uh, perhaps hear more than what I say here. Okay, okay thank you very much. Uh, Professor Cox, I'm giving the mic back to uh, Manas. She has a question for you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Professor Cox, I mean, you showed a beautiful Im uh, images of protoplanetary disk uh, in continuum as well as line. And I mean, we could see really, uh, you know, uh, gaps and holes in the protoplanetary disk, as well as we see a lot of um, molecules are uh, forming. Uh, uh, that actually matching uh, pretty much with the, what is coming out from the simulations. Okay. So my question is whether it is in future or uh, possible to map protoplanetary disk or magnetic field geometry of the protoplanetary disk with ALMA? That's a very good question. And I should have mentioned that. I, I'm sorry I didn't. Um, there have been measurements indeed of the uh, magnetic fields in uh, protoplanetary disks. And I think it's very important because um, it provides you, uh, uh, you know, uh, detailed information on uh, not only the uh, magnetic field, but also eventually on the dust properties. Um, but from what I understand, I mean, these measurements are very difficult to do and their interpretation is also not easy. And uh, uh, there are a lot of effects uh, that uh, alignment effects and whatever that can mimic uh, magnetic fields or not. And, uh, and I think that uh, I haven't really checked the latest developments, but there's a whole group of people working on this. And uh, but very clearly, Alma can do that, and uh, it's it's the next step. I think it's very very important. Yeah. Okay, I, I have another questions. Like you know, uh, like Alma, we get um, I mean I mean data products like phase two data products uh, that one can use uh, possibly for science. Uh, so in for Noema, is there any such plans for future? Uh, you know, to release such data products for public. So in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the case of ARAM, uh, the data that are acquired uh, in the frame of a large program become public. It's, um, it's like a contract. Okay. And so uh, after a certain period of time, uh, when you start the observations, 
the uh, proprietary time, uh, proper, proprietary time is, uh, is, it becomes open and everybody can access the data. There's also a commitment of the people doing uh, large programs to uh, make available uh, the reduced data for the community on, on, a, on a dedicated web page. So there the answer is clear. In terms of the uh, other observations, uh, the data are available, but they are not always in the, uh, in the final um, uh, state as, for instance, in Alma. And uh, that has to do with, uh, I think, historical reasons and also um, has to do because Alma decided to do that since the very beginning and really built up everything in, 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 with that in mind. So it's, it's, it's a huge effort. Uh, to do that, and as far as I know, the, to answer your question uh, for Noema and uh, the 30 meter, only the large programs uh, do have data that are in a readable form and usable by the community. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you. Okay. So, first, so I had a question regarding the uh, um, the boot cloud, like uh, we don't detect it directly for the sun. Uh, it's just a hypothetical uh, uh, assumption. So, but then uh, is it possible that with ALMA we may be able to see some such uh, structures around the nearby stars or something if we go for deep enough? Uh... So, but I, I didn't understand the beginning of your question. Uh... Uh, the old cloud that we have. The for old cloud. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, that's a very good question. <laughs> uh... I think that with um, with Alma, certainly we will be able to detect um, uh, regions of uh, around in disks that are far away, where you know uh, where most of the matter is uh, still in icy forms and etc. Cetera, etc., cetera, which may correspond to the place of the Oort cloud. Mm -hmm. In terms of the Oort cloud itself, I think uh, or, or the Kuiper belt. Um, I think it will be much more difficult if you have a fully evolved system to detect that with Alma. Yeah. Uh, I think Alma is uh, uh, wonderful for detecting everything which is happening before that in the formation of the planets. But when the planets are formed, I think it will be much more complicated. Um, but it's um, it's an in it's an interesting thing. I mean, one of the uh, aspects I haven't uh, put forward here, but which is potentially very very interesting, is that mm -hmm. Alma has the capability to do exquisite um, astrometrical. Um, uh, measurements or positions. And uh, okay. so one of the things that I remember from discussions I had when I was in Chile, uh, people were mm -hmm. promoting the idea to use ALMA to look at uh, uh, displacements of a star uh, mm -hmm. due to a, a nearby planet. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, uh, yeah. And then the other thing I think was, uh, and there was this, this one result, but I think potentially it's extremely extre interesting is also to look at, uh, look at um, lines and proplanetary disks to look at distortions uh, due to mm -hmm. a planet uh, moving through the, through the disk. And you could mm -hmm. see that in, uh, locally, I mean, if you have good enough signal to rise. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting questions. I think Manas has one more. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you, you have gone on detected up to higher city galaxies up to J13.3. So, what is the next prediction? Can we go further <laughs> with, <Yes>. more sensitive, <laughs> with more sensitive instruments? I think that our Japanese colleagues are really very, very keen in getting farther and farther away. And, uh, and as you've seen, I mean, they're successful. Uh, they use a lot of uh, spur time, and again, I think the JWST will change the game. I think in, in the next coming years. Um, I think with, I mean, you know, we're looking always going farther and farther. But I, I would say it's equally important to go in between and to understand the physics of the galaxies. Let's say between six and ten or so, and uh, there is a lot of uh, work being done. I mean. Uh, uh, I couldn't present uh, everything, but uh, particularly with quasars up to redshift was 7.6, I think, um, etc. And so, again, the, the, the main thing is to find these galaxies or these uh, objects and then follow them up with ALMA or the uh, adequate instrument. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty convinced that uh, if you look at the 
um, increase of such sources that have been found over the last few years, it looks uh, very, um, you know, um, optimistic. I mean, I'm optimistic. Yeah. The question is how to follow them up. And if we uh, come back to what I said before is, uh, will these sources be, uh, you know, strong enough to be detectable in uh, the molecules and the dust, et cetera? And, uh, how, yeah, how you can follow them up and study them. Yeah. yeah, as you said that it is indeed very, uh, I mean, uh, useful to study nearby galaxies. And we can see that from your nearby galaxies images, the spiral arms, the kinematics of the gas and the dynamics of the gas, how it is help, helping us to understand the you know, galaxy evolution. That's really yeah. you know, am amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, yeah. Thank okay. you. OK, thanks, Manish. And, uh, Thank you very much, uh, Professor Cox, for uh, you know taking the time to patiently answer all our questions. No, it's I my still... pleasure. I, I love it. <laughs> yeah. it's, uh... Thank you so much. And uh, I look forward to the results coming out next week. And uh, uh, you know, yeah, I think it's on. Uh, I don't know what the time is, but I heard it was in March, on, on May the twelfth. So, uh, right. Yeah. I, think it, I hope it will be spectacular. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I now request uh, Dr. Durga Prasad to please uh, propose a vote of thanks to us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ganesh. Uh, so I'll be doing a pleasant duty of uh, thanking our speaker today. Uh, on Sorry. behalf of the entire PRL family, and in particular our Amrit Vyakyan committee, I thank Professor Pia Cox for accepting our invitation and delivering the 40th Vyakyan of our 75 episode PRL Kamrad Vyakyan series. Thank you very much, sir, for your very informative, wonderful and amazing Vyakyan, highlighting the capabilities and recent accomplishments of ALMA and NOIMA, in particular in the sub-millimeter sub domain. I also thank you for patiently answering all the questions from our viewers. I thank so, our director, Professor Anil Bhardwaj, for his continued support and encouragement for keeping this vacant series going on. I thank Professor Palam Raju, our Dean, who has been behind us, Professor Nandita Chair and Dr. Lokesh, co-chair of our Amrit Vyakyan Committee and all other members of the committee for their constant efforts. Most importantly, lot of thanks to all of our participants and viewers who have just uh, who have joined us through WebEx as well as YouTube for this vacuum today. With this, we come to the end of this episode. Now we sign off from PRL. Stay tuned and keep following us. See you all next week with another new and interesting vacuum. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much to you. Thank you, Professor Carl. Yeah, thank you. See you sometimes in India.